What's up YouTube and welcome to my pickups video for the month of February 2021. Didn't do a whole lot of travel this month, it was pretty much just in-state finds as well as a couple things I bought online. A uh, little bit of a light month, but there were some things in this month that I've really been playing a lot and capturing a lot of my attention, so I'll talk about those as we get to them. Uh, the bulk of this video is going to be Sony pickups this month, so we'll go ahead and start off with some games for the PS1. And the first one of these is one that's very well known on the PS1, but for some reason I never had this in my library, and that is Monster Rancher. Um, I also do not have the sequel to this. There's a Monster Rancher 2 for the PS1. And for some reason I've just never picked up either one. Both of these games are pretty well known, like I said, for the PlayStation. It spun off a uh, longer series that kind of went on from here. Uh, the gimmick with these, if you're unfamiliar, this was an early Tecmo game for the PS1, and uh, since CDs, music CDs, were still pretty popular during this era, you could put in any music CD into your PlayStation, it would read it, and then based, based on the track length of the overall disc, um, it would create a monster for you based in this game, and then you could save it to your, your memory card. So there was actually, like, I remember back in the day in Tips and Tricks magazine, you would uh, see lists of certain CDs that you may want to buy <laughs> just to get select monsters in this game. And there was, like, specific discs that had some of the best monsters out there. It was kind of an interesting little gimmick. Um, kind of like to try this out just to see how it is in retrospect. I know the series has some fans. The series went on to several other systems after this. Um, but also would like to get the sequel to this game. I just never can seem to find either of these at a decent price. So... Decided to buck up and buy this one, and uh, may get the second one at some point. Uh, another PS1 game I got this month that is, was not on my radar, I just happened to get it because it was cheap in one of my local stores, is The Mummy, uh, based on the Brendan Fraser movie of the time. And I thought it was kind of interesting, I remember advertisements for this game when it first came out, and that it was supposed to come out for the PS1 as well as the Dreamcast, but for some reason the Dreamcast version of this game got cancelled. Um, I have noticed this game is starting to go up in price a little bit, so maybe it's actually somewhat decent, or it's just that PS1 is so hot right now that just about anything is going up in price. Um, so I decided to go ahead and grab it, and I guess I'll hang on to it. Maybe I'll have to give it a try and see how it is. Perhaps it's like a Tomb Raider-style game. I'm not really sure like how they turned the movie into a game for the PS1, um, but I do know they made some sequels to this that went on to other systems as well, so maybe it's decent. I also noticed it's a Konami-published uh, game, but I don't think they developed it, so... Kind of a, a weird one that, um, like I said, I wasn't expecting to get, but decided to get. Um, speaking of Konami games that were also not really on my radar until recently, this is Psy Girls for the PS2. And this is uh, kind of a weird one as well. Um, this one was based on some Japanese action figures that they turned into a game. And it has um, these two characters. One of them is like an assassin and one is like a ninja. And there's actually two separate discs in the, in the package and based on which character you want to play as, that's the disc you pop in. So they're not necessarily meant to be played um, in chronological order, it's just you pick which character you'd prefer to play. Kind of a neat gimmick. Um, I did watch some gameplay footage of this. It has some hilariously bad voice acting in it, and I don't think this was a very high-budget game uh, by any means. Also thought it was a little interesting that it has a mature rating, so it's kind of conflicting, like was it going for a younger audience who might be familiar with the uh, action figures? Or was it really intended for adults only, like it's kind of branded as? So, um, not exactly a, a high potential game for the PS2 that I think a lot of people are talking about, but I do like quirky Japanese titles, so I decided to give this a shot and we'll see how it is. Uh, next, we're going to move on to PS4, and I did buy a new release this month. I don't buy a lot of new releases, and it was kind of interesting because I bought this on day one in the, in the retail store setting. Uh, that game is one that I've seen in several other videos the last couple weeks, was people are doing their pickups for the month, and that is the newest Ease series game. This is Ease 9 uh, Monstrum Nox, and uh, I did start playing this. I really am enjoying it so far. However, the next game I'm going to show you totally disrupted my flow in this game, and I've shelved it for the moment, but I do need to come back to it because I really was liking what I played so far. Uh, the reason I decided to buy this game on release is that uh, Ease 8 for the PS4 got really hard to find and expensive very quickly, and I did manage finally to track one of those down, but I didn't want to be in the same boat with this one. Um, I've always liked the Ease series, it's not like my favorite ever, but there are some pretty cool games along the way that came out in that series, and overall I'm really enjoying this one, uh, the little bit that I got into before I get disrupted <laughs> with the theme of it. 
Um, this game is all about uh, the concept of imprisonment, both figuratively as well as literally, and it's uh, really a nice fit for kind of our quarantine times that we live in. So I think that this one um, overall is an improvement over Ease 8 as far as what I've played with it so far, and uh, the action is very fast and frantic as uh, you, you tend to see in the Ease games. So looking forward to playing this one some more, and again, I didn't want to be um, lost you know, a few months from now not being able to find a copy. Um, actually got this at my local Best Buy. They happened to, to be the first ones that got this game in, and even my local GameStop wasn't showing that they had it in stock. Um, for some reason, I think the Switch version of this has been delayed a little bit in the U.S., so that's probably going to be coming out in a few months, uh, but ultimately I wanted this for the PS4 anyway. Uh, one thing that's nice about this is it does have an actual manual or slash art book, I guess, with it, as well as a um, soundtrack sampler disc. So. There is a deluxe version of this game you can get, but even if you get the basic version like I did, it does have some nice little bonuses included in the package, which, uh, you know, NIS do usually does a nice job with. So I am looking forward to playing this some more once I get past the next game I'm going to show you. All right, so let's go into the game that has completely sucked up my game playing time for the month. Uh, this one I happened to buy just off um, my local, you know, video game chain retailer that has used games, and this is 428 Shibuya Scramble. Uh, this is an amazing visual novel, and I probably just lost half of you by saying it's a visual novel. Uh, trust me, this one is different. <laughs> I'm not usually the biggest visual novel fan, but this one has enough um, differences to keep me interested. So what this is, is a game that originally started in the Wii in 2009 in Japan. We obviously never got it here. It then made its way to the PS3 as well as the PSP in Japan. We didn't get either of those. And then somehow Spike Chunsoft decided to take a, uh, a stab at releasing the PS4 version of this game in around 2018 in the U.S. Um, I don't think this game sold very well because I'd never heard anybody talking about this until uh, I recently learned about it. But it is really an interesting journey. Um, the thing that makes this one very stand out from other visual novels is it's not told just through like hand-drawn artwork like most of those games are. This one is used with uh, real character actors filming scenes throughout Japan in the Shibuya district. So uh, really neat to see just how much work went into this game, having all these actors on the streets of Japan and uh, playing out the, the, the tale you know, throughout that. Um, there are five playable characters in this game and you need to play as all five to make your way through the game. And it all takes place over the course of one day broken up into several one hour segments. Um, so I think over the course of the eight or nine hour day, I'm on like hour six and I've put a lot of time in this game to get to that point. Um, it has been incredibly rewarding. There are some frustrating moments as far as how you select some of the options in this game, um, but overall you're able to get past it and still enjoy the game a lot. Um, I give this game my highest recommendation. I don't uh, you know, get a game like this that really grabs me <laughs> these days that much, especially for the PS4, and uh, really can recommend this uh, to you know my wide audience of, of people that may be interested in a quirky Japanese game like this. Um, really wish this game had done better, but uh, overall I think this one is one you don't want to miss out on. So, highest recommendation to this, and hoping to uh, wrap this up in the next couple weeks for myself. Really want to see how the story ends, because it's incredibly weird um, so far as all the different things that are going on. And it throws you for so many different loops along the way, too. So, really cool game, and uh, happy I grabbed that one. Uh, next we're going to move on to some portable games. So, I'll talk about some games for Nintendo systems first. Um, first one of these is another one that wasn't on my radar. I just recently learned about this game and decided to grab it. This is Extreme Sports for the Game Boy Color, and uh, not at all a title or uh, game that I would typically be interested in, but what makes this one unique is it is a way forward design game, and this was actually one of their first release games that they put out for the Game Boy Color uh, before they moved on to things like Shantae and Windy uh, for the system. So. Really uh, looking forward to checking this out. I just got this this weekend, so I haven't got into it yet. I've noticed it's starting to spike in price a little bit. I found it cheap, but uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of these out there, because really looking at the artwork now, it's not something I see in stores very frequently. Um, the only reason I think it's titled like that and kind of generic through this publisher, Infogrames, is they had an extreme sports game for the Dreamcast that they also published during this time that had a completely different um, gameplay style and had nothing to do with Way Forward. So... If you're a way forward fan, you probably already know about this game, but this was one that um, just really wasn't on my radar, and looking forward to checking it out a little bit. Um, another game I bought that is loose for the Game Boy Advance, and I don't like to buy loose Game Boy Advance games, but this is one I just really wanted to try. This is the uh, Sega Arcade Gallery, and this has a collection of some of the early 
Sega um, arcade games that had like motion cabinets and things like that. So this has um, Afterburner on it, Space Harrier, Hang On, and then my favorite, which is Outrun. Uh, what I can say about this is they did a really nice job with the visuals of Outrun, especially. Um, it plays very smoothly as far as the scrolling on the Game Boy Advance, and I think that the system actually is, is well equipped to handle the, uh, the graphics of the game. Uh, one thing I like is they left the original um, character, or Ferrari Testarossa sprite in the game. They didn't alter it, like some of the newer versions of that game have been uh, due to branding issues. Um, the one thing I will say about it, though, is the sound effects are completely off. Um, there are some sound effects in the arcade game that are well known that either are muted or just don't show up at all in this version of the game. So I think they could have done a little bit better on, on the sound design. Um, I'm just nitpicking because I'm just such a big OutRun fan, so just kind of neat to see this on the portable system. I'd like to get this eventually complete, but overall the artwork on it's not that exciting anyway, so it's not going to look that great on the box. And uh, for now, I just wanted to play it. So happy I got this. Um, I think the other games in the collection hold up pretty well. There are, again, some glitches with as far as the sound design, even on like Space Harrier that I'm familiar with. Uh, but overall, OutRun is probably the main draw in this collection. Uh, next, we'll move on to a 3DS game, and uh, I know I've been saying this for several videos. If you've been watching my videos, I still don't even own a 3DS, but I still keep buying games every once in a while that might be interesting to add to the library. Um, someday I might get a 3DS, but for so far, the system's just never dropped in price, and with the current situation, they're not looking to drop in price anytime soon. So once I get one um, in decent condition, I'll have a few games built up to play on it. Um, so the game I got was Boulder Dash uh, XL 3D, <laughs> kind of a mouthful of a game title. Um, this was originally a computer game from the early days of gaming, and then it's evolved multiple times with uh, several different console versions and handheld versions over the years. Um, I do also have the Boulder Dash game for Game Boy Advance, and it's pretty good. So I was hoping that this one might be decent too, and I, it actually would be a game that would probably be pretty well su suited to the 3D mode. Um, so looking forward to checking that out eventually. It does also have um, a version of the original Boulder Dash built onto the card as well, so just another way to play the game as well if you're interested in the series. Um, so next we'll move on to one that I've been looking for for a long time. Um, I am trying to build the complete set of Neo Geo Pocket Color games, and I got one off my want list this month from eBay. Um, this is Dive Alert Becky's version. Um, <laughs> what is interesting about this one is it also has a Dive Alert Matt's version, and they are... Uh, similar games that have two separate lead characters broken up into two separate um, releases. I do have the Matt's version already, so I've been looking for the Becky's version for a long time. Um, they're very sim-heavy games. They're submarine sims, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, so I really haven't got into Matt's version too much, and I haven't popped in Becky's version yet. I would imagine it's going to play very similar, just with some different storylines and things like that. But um, this has been a real challenge to find. I've never seen this game in a store in all my years of game hunting, so... It's one of the ones I just had to bite the bullet and buy on eBay uh, for the collection. But it gets me a little bit closer to the complete set. Um, there are a few more that look to be pretty challenging to get. Uh, but overall, it's not a huge quantity of games I need. It's just a matter of finding them. So happy to get another one of these in the collection. And uh, we'll go from there and hopefully continue on the collection. Um, I did buy a PC game this month. And really, the only reason I bought this is, number one, it was in a dollar bin of CDs that happen to have a PC game in it. And number two, the artwork on it cracked me up. So I'm going to share that with you now, and hopefully you'll have the same enjoyment. Um, this is Williams Arcade Classics for the PC, and I think it came out around 96 or 97. Uh, we got this game on several systems, from things like Super Nintendo to PS1 to um, Genesis. Just about everything had Williams Arcade Classics. Um, however, this artwork, as far as I know, is unique to the PC version, and like I said, it cracked me up when I saw it. Um, so this is your little corporate businessman in his loafers after work, I guess, after a long day at the office, getting blown away by the uh, the graphical power of Joust, I'm imagining, on the arcade cabinet. So um, I just had to have this. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I thought it was kind of funny. And uh, for a dollar, you know, you can't go wrong with artwork like that. So um, kudos to whoever designed the artwork for this. I wish they'd done the artwork for all the other console versions as well, just because it's very funny. But uh, nice to have just a little oddity like that in the collection also. Uh, next let's move on to some hardware and accessories. So I actually did buy a game system this month. Um, not really one that I needed in the collection, but one that I just couldn't pass up. So I was uh, 
hunting at a local pawn shop a couple weeks ago and uh, normally don't find anything in the store and then I came across a PlayStation and you're thinking big deal a PlayStation <laughs> but uh, I couldn't pass this up it was $16 it came with all the controllers and a DualShock or I'm sorry it came with the DualShock and all the the wires and things like that for it and it just seemed to be in really clean condition uh, most of the PS ones I see these days are just really beat to hell and this one um, presented very nicely in the store so for 16 bucks, I couldn't pass it up, and then uh, my interest was piqued even more as I started to look at the ports on the back and um, uncovered the model number on the bottom of the system. Um, this is a 7500 series PS1, and what I'm reading is this may be the best of all the early uh, PlayStation 1 systems. The reason for that is that this one has a revised motherboard that fixed some of the issues with the 5000 series PlayStation, and then this one is the last of the original body PlayStations to still have the serial port on the back um, where you can hook up a Game Shark or like a import um, swap device, things like that. So this one has been refined quite a bit, but it still remains the original functionality of the serial port. There's also a 9000 series PS1 where the serial port was then removed. So this may be the best of both worlds as far as uh, more reliable hardware as well as the original um, connections on the back to hook up different peripherals and things like that. So what am I going to do with this? Um, I'm not fully sure, but for now I'm going to hang on to it. I still have a PlayStation 1000 series that I bought new in 1997 and that's still working. So for now this is just going to be a nice little trusty backup to that one and uh, we'll see what I decide to do with it. But I couldn't let this thing just linger uh, without a home for 16 bucks. It just is it's too clean and too nice. So um, PS1s are just starting to go up in price a little bit and uh, I don't think it can hurt to have a, a backup system like this in the, in the collection. So. That's, uh, that's my story on that one. Um, another piece of hardware from the 90s that uh, I never owned was the Sega Saturn Racing Wheel. And this was a officially licensed uh, piece of hardware in the United States. Um, this did not ever come with foot pedals, so it's literally just a steering control. Um, it does have the nice six button control layout on it with all the different buttons. But what I really liked uh, about the uh, function of this is it has a nice nice clicky paddle shifter set up with it. So a little bit better quality than what you got on most of the junky racing wheels of the mid 90s that people were eager to buy at the time. Um, also has a nice solid construction and has suction cups on the base so you can hook it up to a, a coffee table or whatever. Um, you're also able to adjust the angle of the wheel so that's something that some of the wheels had that this one actually does have. It's a nice little nice touch with it as well. Uh, I haven't had a chance to try this out yet. I'm sure it works just fine because most of the first party hardware is usually pretty stout. Um, but just was kind of curious to have this with, you know, having a complete Saturn collection and I don't have all the official accessories. I thought this was something I needed to add to my collection. So nice little find from uh, one of my local stores and decided to go ahead and pick it up. Uh, the very last thing I'm going to show you this month is something that is kind of a build on something I showed you last month. So one of my decisions recently is I wanted to get a component cable for my PS2. I've been running it on RGB, which works really well for PS1 games in the PS2, but I don't feel like the PS2 games look their best. So I decided I wanted to go in a component cable direction. Um, last month I bought the official Sony cable. This month I found the Monster cable. So this just happened to show up at my local game store, and it was incredibly cheap, so I couldn't pass it up. Um, it is a very beefy cable, much more so than the official cable is, but I don't know which one's necessarily better. So if any of you have experience with using the uh, Monster Component cable versus the Sony PS2 cable, um, very interested to see which you know one you prefer. So I might try them both out and see if there's any difference. There may be no difference whatsoever. I know a lot of these Monster cables were really just built on hype uh, with the super thick, thick construction that really didn't do anything special anyway. So... We'll see. I got this for a few bucks and I figured I couldn't go wrong with it. So um, one, of the, one way or the other, I'm going to use one of these with my PS2. And then, you know, otherwise it may just sit on the back burner if it's not the chosen one. So that about does it for the month. Um, kind of a nice weird mix of stuff for different systems and some accessories and whatnot. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. Please take a moment, like, comment, subscribe. And I will talk to you soon. Have a great day or night, wherever you are.